Chapter Thirteen, Part Two of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue. Chapter Thirteen, Part Two. Meanwhile, Morel, upon recovering from his temporary wildness, had sunk into a state of deep and bitter reflections upon his present position, which, now that his mind saw things through a calmer medium, only increased the poignancy of his sufferings since the notary had proceeded to such extremities any hope from his mercy was vain he felt there was nothing left but to submit to his fate and let the law take its course are we ever to get off inquired bourdin i tell you what my man if you are not for marching we must make you that's all i cannot leave these diamonds about in this manner my wife is half distracted cried morel pointing to the stones lying on his work-table the person for whom i am polishing them will come to fetch them away either this morning or during the day they are of considerable value capital whispered tortillard who was still peeping in at the half-closed door capital capital what will mother chouette say when i tell her this bit of luck only give me till to-morrow said morel beseechingly only till i can return these diamonds to my employer i tell you the thing can't be done so let's have no more to say about it but it is impossible for me to leave diamonds of such value as these exposed to be lost or even stolen in my absence well then take them along with you we have got a coach waiting below for which you will have to pay when you settle the cost we will go all together to your employer's house and if you don't meet with him why then you can deposit these jewels at the office of the prison where they will be as safe as in the bank only look sharp and let's be off before your wife and children perceive us give me but till to-morrow only to bury my child implored morel in a supplicating voice half stifled by the heavy sobs he strove in vain to repress nonsense i tell you why we have lost an hour here already besides it's dull work going to barons chimed in malicorne it would be too much for your feelings perhaps yes said morel bitterly it is dull work to see what we would have given our lives to have laid in the cold earth but as you are men grant me that satisfaction then looking up and observing the nonchalant air with which his prayer was received he added but no persons of so much feeling as you are would fear to indulge me lest i should find it a gloomy sight well then at least grant me one word the deuce take your last words why old chap there seems no end to them come put the steam on make haste said malicorne with brutal impatience or we shall lose t'other gent we're after when did you receive orders to arrest me oh why judgment was signed four months ago but it was only yesterday our officer got instructions to put it in execution only yesterday and why has it been delayed so long how the devil should i know come look about you and put up your things only yesterday and during the whole day we saw nothing of louise where can she be or what has become of her inquired the lapidary mentally as he took from his table a small box filled with cotton in which he placed his stones but never mind all that now i shall have plenty of time to think about it when i am in prison come look sharp there a bit tie up your things to take with you and put your clothes on there's a fine fellow i have no clothes to tie up and i have nothing whatever to take with me except these jewels that i may deposit them at the office of the prison well then dress yourself as quick as you can i have no other dress than what you now see me in i say mate cried bourdin does he really mean to be seen in our company with such rags as those on i fear indeed i shall shame such gentlemen as you are said morel bitterly it don't much signify replied malicorne as nobody will see us in the coach father cried one of the children mother is calling for you listen to me said morel addressing one of the men with hurried tones if one spark of human pity dwells within you grant me one favour i have not the courage to bid my wife and children farewell it would break my heart and if they see you take me away they will try to follow me i wish to spare all this therefore i beseech you to say in a loud voice that you will come again in three or four days and pretend to go away you can wait for me at the next landing-place and i will come to you in less than five minutes that will spare all the misery of taking leave i am quite sure it would be too much for me 
and that i should become mad i was not far off it a little while ago not to be caught answered malicorne you want to do me but i'm up to you you mean to give us the slip you old chouse god of heaven cried morel with a mixture of grief and indignation has it come to this i don't think he means what you say whispered bourdin to his companion let us do what he asks we shall never get away unless we do i'll stand outside the door there is no other way of escaping from this garret he cannot get away from us very well but what a dog-hole what a place for a man to care about leaving why a prison would be a palace to it then addressing morel he said now then be quick and we will wait for you on the next landing so make up some pretence for our going well said bourdin in a loud voice and bestowing a significant look at the unhappy artisan since things are as you say and as you think you shall be able to pay us in a short time why we shall leave you for the present and return in about four or five days but you must not disappoint us then remember thank you gentlemen i have no doubt i shall be able to pay you then the bailiffs then withdrew while tortillard hearing the men talk of quitting the room had hastened downstairs for fear of being detected listening there madame morel said rigolette endeavouring to draw the wife of the lapidary from the state of gloomy abstraction into which she had fallen do you hear that the men have gone and left your husband undisturbed mother mother exclaimed the children joyfully they have not taken father away morel morel murmured madeleine her brain quite turned take one of those diamonds take the largest and sell it no one will know it and then we shall be delivered from our misery poor little adele will get warm then and come back to us taking advantage of the instant when no one was observing him the lapidary profited by it to steal from the room one of the men was waiting for him on the little landing-place which was also covered only by the roof on this small spot opened the door of a garret which adjoined the apartment occupied by the morels and in which m pipelet kept his depot of leather and further this little angular recess in which a person could not stand upright was dignified by the melancholy porter with the name of his melodramatic cabinet because by means of a hole between the lath and plaster he frequently indulged in the luxury of woe by witnessing the many touching scenes occasioned by the distress of the wretched family who dwelt in the garret beyond it this door had not escaped the lynx eye of the bailiff who had for a time suspected his prisoner of intending either to escape or conceal himself by means of it now then let us make a start of it cried he beginning to descend the stairs as morel emerged from the garret rather a ragged recruit to march with added he beckoning the lapidary to follow him only an instant one single instant for the love of god exclaimed morel as kneeling down he cast a last look on his wife and children through a chink in the door then clasping his hands he said in a low heart-broken voice while bitter tears flowed down his haggard cheeks adieu my poor children my wife may heaven preserve you all farewell farewell come don't get preaching said bourdin coarsely or your sermons may keep us here till night which is what i can't stand for i'm almost froze to death as it is ugh what a kennel what a hole morel rose from his knees and was about to follow the bailiff when the words father father sounded up the staircase louise exclaimed the lapidary raising his hands towards heaven in a transport of gratitude thank god i shall be able to embrace you before i go heaven be praised i am here in time cried the voice as it rapidly approached and quick light steps were distinguishable swiftly ascending the stairs don't be uneasy my dear said a second voice evidently proceeding from some individual considerably behind the first speaker but whose thick puffing and laborious breathing announced the coming of one who did not find mounting to the top of the house so easy an affair as it seemed to her light-footed companion the reader may perhaps have already guessed that the last comer was no other than madame pipelet who less agile than louise was compelled to advance at a much slower pace louise is it indeed you my own my good louise said morel still weeping but how pale you look for mercy's sake my child what is the matter nothing father nothing i assure you said louise in much agitation but i have run so fast see i have brought the money what you are free you knew then that 
oh yes here sir you will find it quite right said the poor girl placing the rouleau of gold in the hands of malicorne but this money louise how did you become possessed of it i will tell you all about it by and by pray do not be uneasy let us go and comfort my mother come father no not just this minute cried morel remembering that as yet louise was entirely ignorant of the death of her little sister wait an instant i have something to say to you first but about this money all right said malicorne as having finished counting the gold he put it in his pocket precisely one thousand three hundred francs and is that all you have got for me my pretty dear i thought father said louise struck with alarm and surprise at the man's question that you only owed one thousand three hundred francs nor do i replied morel precisely so answered the bailiff the original debt is one thousand three hundred francs well that is all right now and we may put settled against that but then you see there are the costs caption etc amounting to eleven hundred and forty francs still to be paid gracious heavens cried louise i thought one thousand three hundred francs would pay everything but sir we will make up the money and bring it to you very soon take this for the present it is a good sum take it as paid on account it will go towards the debt at least won't it father very well then all you have to do is to bring the required sum to the prison and then and not till then your father if he is your father will be set at liberty come master we must start or we shall never get there do you really mean to take him away do i don't i just look here i am ready to give you a memorandum of having received so much on account and whenever you bring the rest you shall have a receipt in full and your father along with it there now that's a handsome offer ain't it mercy mercy supplicated louise phew cried the man here's a scene over again my stars i hope this one isn't a going mad too for the whole family seems uncommon queer about the head well i declare i never see anything like it it is enough to set a man's perspiring in the midst of winter and here the bailiff burst into a loud coarse laugh at his own brutal wit oh my poor dear father exclaimed louise almost distractedly when i had hoped to have saved you no no cried the lapidary in a tone of utter despair and stamping his foot in wild desperation hope nothing for me god has forgotten me and heaven has ceased to be just to a wretch like me calm yourself my worthy friend said a rich manly voice there is always a kind providence that watches over and preserves good and honest men like you at the same instant rodolph appeared at the door of the small recess we have spoken of from whence he had been an invisible spectator of much that we have related he was pale and extremely agitated at this sudden apparition the bailiff drew back with surprise while morel and his daughter gazed at the stranger with bewildered wonder taking from his waistcoat pocket a quantity of folded banknotes rodolph selected three and presenting them to malicorne he said here are two thousand five hundred francs give this young woman back the money you have just received from her still more and more astonished at this singular interference the man half hesitated to take the notes and when he had received them he eyed them with the utmost suspicion turning and twisting them about in every direction at length satisfied both as to their reality and genuineness he finally deposited them in his pocket-book but as his surprise and alarm began to subside so did his natural coarseness of idea return and eyeing rodolph from head to foot with an impertinent stare he exclaimed the notes are right enough but pray who and what are you that go about with such sums i should just wish to know whose it is and how you came by it rodolph was very plainly dressed and his appearance by no means improved by the dust and dirt his clothes had gathered during his stay in m pipelet's cabinet of melodrama i desired you to give back the gold you received just now from this young person replied rodolph in a severe and authoritative tone you desired me and who the devil are you to give your orders answered the man approaching rodolph in a threatening manner give back the gold give it back i say said the prince grasping the wrist of malicorne so tightly that the unhappy bailiff winced beneath his iron clutch i say bawled he hands off will you curse me if i don't think your old nick himself 
i am sure your fingers are cased with iron then return the money why you despicable wretch do you want to be paid twice over now return the gold and be gone or if you utter one insolent word i'll fling you over the banisters well don't kick up such a row there's the girl's money said malicorne giving back to louise the rouleau he had received but mind what you are about my sparky and don't think to ill-use me because you happen to be the strongest that's right said bourdin esconcing himself behind his taller associate and who are you i should like to know who give yourself such airs who is he why my lodger my king of lodgers you ill-looking half-starved hungry hounds you ill-taught dirty fellows exclaimed madame pipelet who puffing and panting for breath had at last reached the landing where they stood her head as usual adorned with her brutus wig which during the heat and bustle she had experienced in ascending the stairs had got pushed somewhat awry while in her hand she bore an earthen stew-pan filled with smoking hot broth which she was charitably conveying to the morels what the devil does this old hedgehog want cried bourdin if you dare make any of your saucy speeches about me returned madame pipelet i'll make you feel my nails ay and my teeth too if you provoke me and if you don't mend your manners my lodger my king of lodgers will pitch you over the banisters and i will sweep you out into the street as i would a heap of rubbish this old beldam will bring the whole house about our ears said bourdin to malicorne we've touched the blunt our expenses and all so i say off is a good word here take your property said the latter flinging a bundle of law papers at the feet of morel pick them up and deliver them decently you have been paid as a respectable officer would have been act like one cried rodolph seizing the bailiff vigorously with one hand while with the other he pointed to the papers fully convinced by this second powerful grip how useless any attempt at resistance would prove the bailiff stooped down and mechanically picking up the papers gave them to morel who scarcely venturing to credit his senses believed himself under the influence of a delightful dream well young chap grumbled out malicorne although you have got a fist as strong as a drayman's mind you if ever you fall into my clutches i'll make you smart for this so saying he doubled his fist at rodolph and then scrambled down the stairs taking four or five at a time followed by his companion who kept looking behind him with indescribable terror while madame pipelet burning to avenge the insults offered to her king of lodgers looked at her steeping stewpan with an air of inspiration and heroically exclaimed the debts of the morels are paid henceforward they will have plenty of food and can do without my messes look out there below so saying she stooped over the banisters and poured the contents of her stewpan down the backs and shoulders of the two bailiffs who had just reached the first floor landing there goes screamed out the delighted portress capital ha <laughs> ha there they are two regular sops in the pan well i do enjoy this what the devil is this exclaimed malicorne thoroughly soaked with the hot greasy liquid i say i wish you would mind what you are about there you old figure of fun alfred bawled madame pipelet in a tone sharp and shrill enough to have split the tympanum of a deaf man alfred my old darling have at em. they wanted to behave ill to your stasi anastasi the nasty fellows have been taking liberties quite violent knock them down with your broom and call the oyster woman and the man at the wine vaults to help you get out you get 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 out ch -ch -ch. thieves thieves robbers ch -ch. Brrr, hoo -hoo -hoo. knock them knock them down that's right old dear pay them off break their bones serve them out boom 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 and by way of conclusion to this concatenation of discordant noises accompanied by a constant succession of stamping and kicking of feet madame pipelet carried away by the excitement of the moment flung her earthen stewpan to the bottom of the staircase which breaking into a thousand pieces at the very instant that the two bailiffs terrified by the yells and noises from overhead were precipitately descending the stairs with hasty strides added not a little to their terror ha 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 cried anastasie bursting into loud fits of laughter now be off with you i think you have had enough 
then crossing her arms she stood like a triumphant amazon rejoicing in the victory she had achieved while madame pipelet was thus venting her rage upon the bailiffs morel had thrown himself in heartfelt gratitude at the feet of rodolph ah oh, sir exclaimed he when at last words came to his assistance you have saved a whole family to whom do we owe this unhoped-for assistance to the god who watches over and protects all honest men as your immortal Béranger says note the following are some curious particulars relative to bodily restraint as cited in the pauvre jacques a journal published under the patronage of the society for the furtherance and protection of christianity prison committee comité des prisons a protest and intimation of bodily restraint are generally carried out by sheriff's officers and charged by law the first four francs thirty-five centimes the second four francs seventy centimes for these however the officers usually demand for the former ten francs forty centimes for the second sixteen francs forty centimes thus illegally claiming from the unfortunate victims of law twenty-six francs eighty centimes for that which is fixed by that very law at nine francs fifty centimes for an arrest the legal charge is including stamp and registering three francs fifty centimes coach hire five francs for arrest and entry in the prison books sixty francs twenty five centimes office dues eight francs total seventy six francs seventy five centimes a bill of the usual scale ordinarily charged by sheriff's officers now lying before us shows that these allowances by law are magnified by the extortion of the officers into a sum of about two hundred forty francs instead of the seventy-six francs they are alone entitled to claim the same journal says sheriff's officer blank, has been to our office requesting us to correct an article which appeared in one of our numbers headed a woman hung i did not hang the woman observed he angrily we did not assert that he did but to prevent any further misapprehension content ourselves with reprinting the paragraph in question a few days ago a sheriff's officer named blank, went to the rue de la lune to arrest a carpenter who dwelt there the man perceiving him from the street rushed hastily into his house exclaiming i am a ruined man the officers are here to arrest me his wife at these words hastened to secure the door while the carpenter ran to a room on the top of the house to conceal himself the officer finding admittance refused went and fetched a magistrate and a blacksmith the door was forced and on proceeding upstairs the woman was found hanging in her own bedchamber the officer did not allow himself to be diverted from the pursuit by the side of the corpse he continued his search and at length discovered the husband in his hiding-place i arrest you cried the bailiff i have no money replied the man then you must go to prison let me at least bid my wife adieu it is not worth while waiting for that your wife is dead she has hung herself now monsieur blank, adds the journal we have quoted what have you to say to that you see we have merely copied your own statement upon oath in which you have detailed all these frightful circumstances with horrible minuteness the same journal also cites two or three hundred similar facts of which the following may serve as a specimen the expenses upon a note of hand for three hundred francs have been run up by the sheriff's officers to nine hundred sixty four francs the debtor therefore who is a mere artisan with a family of five children has been detained in prison for the last seven months the author of this work had a double reason for borrowing thus largely from the pages of the pauvre jacques in the first place to show that the horrors of the last chapter are far below reality in their painful details and secondly to prove that if only viewed in a philanthropic light the allowing such a state of things to go on namely the exorbitant and illegal fees both demanded and exacted by certain public functionaries frequently acts as a preventive to the exercise of benevolence and paralyzes the hand of charity thus were a small capital of one thousand francs collected among kind-hearted individuals three or four honest though unfortunate artisans might be released from a prison and restored to their families by employing the above-named sum in paying the debts of such as were incarcerated for amounts varying from two hundred and fifty to three hundred francs 
but when the original debt is increased threefold by the excessive and illegal expenses even the most charitable recede from the good work of delivering a fellow-creature from the impression that two-thirds of their well-intentioned bounty would only go into the pockets of pampered sheriff's officers and their satellites and yet no class of unfortunate beings stand more in need of aid and charitable assistance than the unfortunate class we have just been speaking of end of chapter thirteen part two read by celine major chapter fourteen part one of the mysteries of paris volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter fourteen part one rigolette louise the daughter of the lapidary was possessed of more than ordinary loveliness of countenance a fine tall graceful person uniting by the strict regularity of her faultless features and elegance of her figure the classic beauty of juno with the lightness and elegance assigned to the statue of the hunting diana spite of the injury her complexion had received from exposure to weather and the redness of her well-shaped hands and arms occasioned by household labour despite even the humble dress she wore the whole appearance of louise morel was stamped with that indescribable air of grace and superiority nature sometimes is pleased to bestow upon the lowly born in preference to the descendant of high lineage we shall not attempt to paint the joy the heartfelt gratitude of this family so wondrously preserved from so severe a calamity even the recent death of the little girl was forgotten during the first burst of happiness rodolph alone found leisure to remark the extreme paleness and utter abstraction of louise whose first ecstasy at finding her father free passed away apparently plunged into a deep and painful reverie anxious to relieve the mind of morel of any apprehensions for the future and also to explain a liberality which might have raised suspicions as to the character he chose to assume rodolph drew the lapidary to the further end of the staircase leaving to rigolette the task of acquainting louise with the death of her little sister and said to him did not a young lady come to visit you and your family on the morning of the day before yesterday yes and appeared much grieved to see the distress we were in then you must thank her not me can it be possible sir that young lady is your benefactress i frequently wait upon her from our warehouse when i hired an apartment here i learned from the portress all the particulars of your case and the painful situation you were placed in relying on this lady's well-known kindness and benevolence i hastened to acquaint her with all i had heard respecting you and the day before yesterday she came herself in order to be fully aware of the extent of your misery the distress she witnessed deeply affected her but as it might have been brought about by misconduct she desired me to take upon myself the task of inquiring into every circumstance relative to your past and present condition with as little delay as possible being desirous of regulating her benevolent aid by the good or bad accounts she might receive of your honesty and good conduct kind excellent lady well might i say as you observed just now to madeline if the rich did but know was not that it is it possible that you are acquainted with the name of my wife who could have told you that my worthy friend said rodolph interrupting morel i have been concealed in the little garret adjoining your attic since six o'clock this morning have you indeed sir yes my honest fellow i have and from my hiding-place heard all that passed among you oh sir but why did you do so i could not have employed more satisfactory means of getting at your real character and sentiments and i was desirous of seeing and hearing all you did or said without your being aware of my presence the porter had me acquainted with this small retreat which he offered to me for a wood-closet this morning i asked his permission to visit it and remained there more than an hour during which time i had ample proof that a more upright noble mind did not exist and that the courageous resignation with which you bore your heavy trials was above all praise nay indeed sir i do not merit such words as these i was born honest i hope and it comes natural to me to act as i have done i am quite sure of that therefore i do not laud your conduct i appreciate it just as i was about to quit my hiding-place to relieve you of the presence of the bailiffs i heard the voice of your daughter and i meant to have allowed her the happiness of saving you unhappily the rapacity of the men deprived poor louise of the full completion of her pious task i then made my appearance 
fortunately i yesterday received several sums that were due to me so i was enabled to advance the money for your benefactress and to pay off your unfortunate debt but your distress has been so great so unmerited and so nobly sustained that the well-deserved interest you have excited shall not stop here and i take upon myself in the name of your preserving angel to promise you henceforward calmness peace and happiness for yourself and family can it be possible but at least sir let me beseech you to tell me the name of this angel of goodness this heavenly preserver that it may dwell in our hearts and on our lips by what name shall we bless her in our prayers think of her and speak of her as the angel she is ah you were right in saying just now that both rich and poor had their sorrows and is this dear lady then unhappy who is free from care and suffering in this world of trial but i see no cause for concealing you from the name of your protectress the lady then is named remembering that madame pipelet was aware of madame d'harville's having at her first coming to the house inquired for the commandant and fearing her indiscreet mention of the circumstance rodolph resumed after a short pause i will venture to tell you this lady's name upon one condition pray go on sir that you never mention it again to any one mind i say to any person whatever i solemnly promise you never to let it pass my lips but may i not hope to be permitted to thank this friend of the unfortunate i will let madame d'harville know your wish but i scarcely think she will consent to it then this generous lady is called the marquise d'harville never will that name be forgotten by me henceforward it will be to me as that of my patron saint the object of my grateful worship oh when i remember that thanks to her my wife children all are saved saved no no not all my little adele has gone from us we shall see her sweet face no more but still i know we must have parted with her sooner or later the dear child's doom was long since decreed here the poor lapidary wiped away the tears which filled his eyes at the recollection of his lost darling as for the last duties that have now to be performed for your poor child said rodolph if you will be guided by me this is how we will arrange it i have not yet begun to occupy my chamber it is large airy and convenient there is already one bed in it and i will give orders to add all that may be requisite for the accommodation of yourself and family until madame d'harville is enabled to find an eligible abode for you the remains of your little daughter can be left in your attic where until the period of interment they can be properly watched and guarded by a priest with all requisite attention i will request m pipelet to take upon himself every necessary arrangement for the mournful office of laying the poor babe in its peaceful grave nay sir but indeed i cannot allow you to be turned out of your apartment now that we are so happily freed from our misery and that i have no longer the dread of being dragged to prison our poor garret will seem to me like a palace more especially if my louise remains to watch over the family as she used to do your daughter shall never again quit you you said a while ago that the first desire of your heart was to have louise always with you well then as a reward for your past sufferings i promise you she shall never leave you more oh sir this is too much it cannot be reality it seems as though i were dreaming some happy dream i fear i have never been as religious as i ought i have in fact known no other religion than that of honour but such a reverse such a change from wretchedness to joy would make even an atheist believe if not in priests at least in a gracious interposing and preserving providence and if said rodolph sadly a father's sorrow for the loss of his child can be assuaged by promises of rewards or recompense i would say that the heavenly hand which takes one child from you gives you back the other true most true and henceforward our dear louise will be with us to help us to forget our poor adele then you will accept the offer of my chamber will you not or else how shall we be able to arrange for the mournful duties to the poor infant think of your wife whose head is already in so weak a state it will never do to allow her to remain with so afflicting a spectacle constantly before her eyes what goodness exclaimed the lapidary thus to remember all 
to think of all oh you are indeed a friend may heaven bless and recompense you come you must reserve your thanks for the excellent lady you term your protecting angel tis her goodness inspires me with a desire to imitate her benevolence and charity i feel assured i am but speaking as she would speak were she here and that all i do she will fully approve so now then it is arranged you will occupy my room but just tell me this jacques ferrand the forehead of morel became clouded over at the mention of this name i suppose continued rodolph there is no doubt as to his being the same jacques ferrand who practises as a notary in the rue du sentier none whatever sir answered morel but do you know him then assailed afresh by his fears for louise the lapidary continued since you overheard all our conversation tell me sir tell me do you not think i have just cause to hate this man as i do for who knows but my daughter my louise the unhappy artisan could not proceed he groaned with anguish and concealed his face with his hands rodolph easily divined the nature of his apprehensions the very step taken by the notary ought to reassure your mind said he as there can be no doubt he was instigated by revenge for your daughter's rejection of his improper advances to proceed to the hostile measures adopted however i have every reason to believe he is a very bad and dangerous man and if my suspicions respecting him are realized said rodolph after a few moments silence then rely on providence to punish him if the just vengeance of the almighty seems occasionally to slumber it awakens sooner or later he is both rich and hypocritical cried the lapidary at the moment of your deepest despair a guardian angel appeared to save you from ruin so at the moment when least expected will an inexorable avenger call upon the notary to atone for his past crimes if he be guilty at this moment rigolette came out of the miserable garret belonging to morel the kind-hearted girl had evidently been shedding tears and was trying to dry her eyes before she descended the stairs directly rodolph perceived her he exclaimed tell me my good neighbour will it not be much better for m morel and his family to occupy my chamber while they are waiting till his benefactress whose agent i am shall have found a comfortable residence for him rigolette surveyed rodolph with an air of unfeigned surprise really cried she at length are you in earnest in making so kind and considerate an offer quite so on one condition which depends on yourself oh all that it is in my power you see i had some rather difficult accounts to arrange for my employer which are wanted as early as possible indeed i expect they will be sent for almost directly my papers are in my room now would you be neighbourly enough to let me bring my work into your apartment and just spare a little corner of your table i should not disturb your work the least in the world and then the whole of the morel family by the assistance of madame pipelet and her husband may at once be established in my apartment certainly i will and with great pleasure neighbours should always be ready to help and oblige each other i am sure after all you have done for poor m morel you have set a good example so i shall be very glad to give you all the assistance in my power monsieur no no don't call me monsieur say my dear friend or a neighbour whichever you prefer unless you lay aside all ceremony i shall not have courage to intrude myself and papers into your room said rodolph smiling well pray don't let that be any hindrance then if you like i'll call you neighbour because you know you are so father father said one of morel's little boys coming out of the garret mother is calling for you make haste father pray do the lapidary hastily followed the child back to his chamber now then neighbour said rodolph to rigolette you must do me one more service with all my heart if it lies in my power to do so i feel quite sure you are a clever manager and housekeeper now we must go to work at once to provide the morels with comfortable clothing and such matters as may be essential to their accommodation in my apartment which at present merely contains my slender stock of bachelor's furniture sent in yesterday beds bedding and a great quantity of requisites will be needed for so many persons and i want you to assist me in procuring them all the comforts i wish them to have with as little delay as possible rigolette reflected a moment and then replied you shall have all this before two hours have passed good clothes 
nicely made warm and comfortable good white linen for all the family two small beds for the children one for the grandmother and in fact all that is required but i can tell you all this will cost a great great deal of money diable and how much oh at least the very least five or six hundred francs for everything yes you see it is a great sum of money said rigolette opening her eyes very wide and shaking her head but we could procure all this within two hours my little neighbour you must be a fairy oh no it is easy enough the temple is but two steps from here and you will get there everything you require the temple yes the temple what place is that what neighbour don't you know the temple no neighbour yet it is the place where such persons as you and i fit themselves out in furniture and clothes when they are economical it is much cheaper than any other place and the things are all so good really i think so well now i suppose how much did you pay for your greatcoat i cannot say precisely what neighbour not know how much you gave for your greatcoat i will tell you in confidence neighbour said rodolph smiling that i owe for it so you see i cannot exactly say oh neighbour neighbour you do not appear to me to be very orderly in your habits alas neighbour i fear not i must cure you of that if you desire that we should continue friends and i see already that we shall be for you seem so kind you will not be sorry to have me for a neighbour i can see you will assist me and i shall assist you we are neighbours and that's why i shall look after your linen you will give me your help in cleaning my room i am up very early in the morning and will call you that you may not be late in going to your work i will knock against the wainscot until you say to me good morning neighbour that's agreed you shall awaken me you shall take charge of my linen and i will clean out your room certainly and when you have anything to buy you must go to the temple for see now for example your greatcoat must have cost you eighty francs i have no doubt well you might have bought one just as good at the temple for thirty francs really that is marvellous and so you think that for four or five hundred francs these poor morels will be completely set up and very comfortable for a long while neighbour an idea comes across me well what is this idea do you understand all about household affairs yes i should think so said rigolette with a slight affectation of manner take my arm then and let us go to the temple and buy all these things for the morels won't that be a good way oh how capital poor souls but then the money i have it what five hundred francs the benefactor of the morels has given me carte blanche and she will spare nothing to see these poor people restored to comfort is there any place where we can buy better supplies than at the temple certainly not you will not find better things anywhere and then there is everything and already there little frocks for children and gowns for the mother well then neighbour let us go at once to the temple ah mon dieu but what nothing only you see my time is everything to me and i am already a little behindhand through coming here to watch over poor madame morel and you must know that an hour in one way and an hour in another that by little and little makes whole days well a day is thirty sous and whether we gain something or nothing we must live but bah never mind i will make up for that at night and then d'ye see parties of pleasure are very rare and i call this one it will seem to me that i am rich 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 and that it is with my own money that i shall buy all these things for the morels so come along neighbour i will throw on my shawl and cap and then i am ready suppose whilst you are doing this i bring my papers to your apartment willingly and then you will see my room said rigolette with pride for it is all tidy which will convince you how early i am in the morning and that if you are idle and a sluggard so much the worse for you for i shall be a troublesome neighbour end of chapter fourteen part one read by celine major
Chapter Fourteen, Part Two of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue. Chapter Fourteen, Part Two. So saying, light as a bird, Rigolette descended the staircase, followed by Rodolphe, who went into his own room to brush off the dust which had settled on him in Monsieur Pipelet's garret we will hereafter disclose how it was that rodolphe was not informed of the carrying off of fleur de marie from the farm at bouqueval and why he had not visited the morels the day after his conversation with madame d'harville rodolphe furnished by way of saving appearances with a thick roll of papers entered rigolette's chamber rigolette was nearly the same age as goualeuse her old prison acquaintance there was between these two young girls the same difference that there is between laughter and tears between joyous light-heartedness and melancholy dejection between the wildest thoughtlessness and a dark and constant reflection on a future between a delicate refined elevated poetic nature exquisitely sensitive and incurably wounded by remorse and a gay lively happy good and compassionate nature rigolette had no sorrows but those derived from the woes of others and with these she sympathized with all her might devoting herself body and soul to any suffering fellow-creature but her back turned on them to use a common expression she thought no more about them she often checked her bursts of laughter by a flood of tears and then checked her tears by renewing her laughter like a real parisian rigolette preferred excitement to calm and motion to repose the loud and echoing harmony of the orchestra at the fete of the chartreuse or the colisee to the soft murmurs of the breeze waters and leaves the bustling disturbance of the thoroughfares of paris to the silent solitude of the fields the brilliancy of fireworks the flaring of the grand finale the uproar of the maroons and roman candles to the serenity of a lovely night starlight clear and still alas yes the dear good little girl actually preferred the pavement of the streets of the capital to the fresh moss of the shaded paths perfumed with violets the dust of the boulevards to the waving of the ears of corn mingled with the scarlet of the wild poppies and the azure of the bluebells rigolette only left her chamber on sundays and each morning to provide her prescribed allowance of chickweed bread milk and millet for herself and her two birds as madame pipelet observed but she lived in paris for paris and would have been wretched to have resided anywhere but in the capital a few words as to the personal appearance of the grisette and we will then introduce rodolphe into the chamber of his neighbour rigolette was scarcely eighteen years of age of middle height rather small than large but so gracefully formed so admirably proportioned so delightfully filled out so entirely in accordance with her step which was light and easy that she seemed perfect of her kind the movement of her finely formed feet always encased in well-made boots of black cloth with a rather thick sole reminded you of the quick pretty and cautious tread of the quail or wagtail she did not seem to walk but to pass over the pavement as if she were gliding over the surface this step so peculiar to grisettes at once nimble attractive and as if somewhat alarmed may doubtless be attributed to three causes their desire to be thought pretty their fear of being mistaken for what they are not and to the desire they always have not to lose a minute in their peregrinations rodolphe had not seen rigolette but by the dim light of morel's garret or on the landing-place equally obscure and he was therefore really struck by the bright and fresh countenance of the young girl when he softly entered her apartment which was lighted up by two large windows he remained motionless for a moment in admiration of the striking picture before his eyes standing in front of a glass placed over her mantelpiece rigolette was tying under her chin the ribbons of a small cap of bordered tulle ornamented with a light trimming of cherry-coloured riband the cap which fitted tightly was placed at the back of her head and thus revealed two large and thick bandeaux of glossy hair shining like jet and falling very low in front her eyebrows fine and well defined seemed as if traced in ink and curved above two large black piercing and intelligent eyes her firm and velvety cheeks were suffused with the rosy hue of health fresh to the eye fresh to the touch like a ripe peach covered with the dew of dawn her small upturned attractive and saucy nose would have been a fortune to any lisette or marton her mouth which was rather large had rosy and moist lips small white close and pearly teeth 
and was laughter-loving and sportive three charming dimples which gave a characteristic grace to her features were placed two in her cheeks and the other in her chin close to a beauty spot a small ebony speck which was most killingly situated at the corner of her mouth between a worked collar which fell very low and the border of the little cap gathered in by a cherry-coloured ribbon was seen a forest of beautiful hair so accurately twisted and turned up that their roots were seen as clearly and as black as if they had been painted on the ivory of that lovely neck a plum-coloured merino gown with a plain back and close sleeves made skilfully by rigolette covered a figure so small and slender that the young girl never wore a corset for economy's sake an ease and unusual freedom in the smallest action of the shoulders and body which resembled the facile undulations of a cat's motions evinced this fact imagine a gown fitting tightly to a form rounded and polished as marble and we must agree that rigolette could easily dispense with this accessory to the toilet of which we have spoken the tie of a small apron of dark green levantine formed a girdle around her waist which might have been spanned by the ten fingers believing herself to be alone for rodolph still remained at the door motionless and unperceived the grisette having smoothed down her bandeau with her small hand white and delicately clean put her small foot on a chair and stooped to tie the lace of her boot this attitude developed to rodolph a portion of a cotton stocking white as snow and a well-formed ankle and leg after the detail we have given of this toilet we may guess that rigolette had selected her prettiest cap and best apron to do honour to her neighbour on their excursion to the temple she found the pretended tradesman's clerk very much to her taste his face at once kind bold and animated pleased her greatly and then he had been so kind to the morels by giving up his room to them so that thanks to this proof of goodness and perhaps also to his good looks rodolph had unwittingly advanced into the confidence of the grisette with giant strides she according to her ideas founded on the compelled intimacy and reciprocal obligation which neighbourhood invites thought herself very fortunate in having such a neighbour as rodolph to succeed to the travelling clerk cabrion and françois germain for she was beginning to find that the next room had remained very long empty and was afraid that she would never again see it occupied in an agreeable manner rodolph took advantage of his invisibility to cast a curious eye around him and he found the apartment even beyond the praises which madame pipelet had bestowed on the extreme cleanliness of the humble home of rigolette nothing could be more lively or better arranged than this apartment a grey paper with green garlands covered the walls the floor painted of a red colour shone like a looking-glass a small earthenware stone was placed in the chimney where was piled up very symmetrically a small store of wood cut so short so thin that without exaggeration each piece might have been compared to a very large match on the stone mantelpiece painted grey marble there were for ornaments two pots of common flowers covered with green moss a small case of boxwood contained a silver watch instead of a pendule on one side was a brass candlestick shining like gold and having in it a small piece of wax light and on the other side no less resplendently one of those lamps formed by a cylinder and a brass reflector supported by a bar of steel and having a base of lead a tolerably large square glass in a black wood frame was over the mantelpiece curtains of grey and green persian cloth with a woollen fringed border cut and worked by rigolette and hung in light rings of black iron decorated the windows and the bed was covered with a counterpane of the same make and material two closets with glass doors and painted white were in each side of the recess enclosing no doubt household utensils the portable stove the fountain brooms etc for none of these things spoiled the neat appearance of the chamber a chest of drawers of well-veined and shining walnut tree four chairs of the same wood a large table for ironing and working covered with one of those green woollen coverings which we sometimes see in a peasant's cottage a straw armchair with a stool to match the constant seat of the workwoman such was the unpretending furniture there was too in one of the window seats a cage with two canary birds the faithful companions of rigolette by one of those notable ideas which occur to the poor this cage was placed in the middle of a large wooden chest about a foot deep placed on a table this chest which rigolette called her bird's garden 
was filled with mould covered with moss during the winter and in spring the young girl sowed grass seeds and planted flowers there rodolph examined the place with interest and entered fully into the cheerful disposition of the grisette he pictured to himself this solitude enlivened by the song of the birds and of rigolette herself in summer no doubt she worked at the open window half veiled by a verdant curtain of sweet peas roses nasturtiums and blue and white convolvulus in winter she warmed herself near her small stove by the soft light of her lamp rodolph was thus reflecting when looking mechanically at the door he saw there a large bolt a bolt which would not have been out of place on the door of a prison this bolt made him reflect it might have two meanings two very distinct uses to close the door on the lover within to close the door on the lover without rodolph was aroused from his reflections by rigolette who turning her head saw him and without changing her attitude said to him what neighbour are you there then the well-formed ankle instantly disappeared beneath the ample skirt of the plum-coloured gown and rigolette added ah mr cunning i was here admiring in silence admiring what neighbour this pretty little room for neighbour you are lodged like a queen why you must know that it is my enjoyment i never go out and so i can do no less than make my home comfortable but really i never saw anything half so nice what pretty curtains and the drawers as handsome as mahogany you must have spent a great deal of money here oh don't mention it if i had of my own four hundred and twenty-five francs when i left the prison and almost all has been spent when you left the prison you yes but it is a very long story of course you do not suppose that i was in prison for anything wrong of course not but how was it after the cholera i was quite alone in the world i was then i think ten years of age but who had taken care of you till then ah some excellent people but they died of the cholera here rigolette's large eyes became moistened they had sold the little they possessed to pay their small debts and i remained without having any one who would take care of me not knowing what to do i went to the guard-house opposite to our house and said to the sentinel sir my relations are dead and i do not know where to go what must i do then the officer came and he took me to the commissary who put me in prison as a vagabond and i did not go out until i was sixteen years old but your relations i do not know who my father was and i was six years old when i lost my mother who had recovered me from the enfant trouvé foundling hospital where she had been compelled at first to place me the kind people of whom i spoke to you lived in our house they had no children and seeing me an orphan they took care of me and what were they what was their business or pursuit papa Critu, so i always called him was a house painter and his wife worked at her needle then they were pretty well off oh like other people in their station though they were not married but they called each other husband and wife they had their ups and downs to-day plenty if there was work to be had to-morrow short commons if there was none but that did not prevent the couple from being content and always cheerful at this remembrance rigolette's face brightened up there was not such a household in the quarter always merry always singing and with it all as good as they could be what they had any one was welcome to share mamma Critu was a plump body about thirty years old as neat as a penny as active as an eel as merry as a lark her husband was a regular good-tempered fellow with a large nose a wide mouth and always a paper cap on his head and such a funny face oh so funny you could not look at him without laughing when he came home after work he did nothing but sing and make faces and gamble like a child he used to dance me on his knees and play with me like a child of my own age and his wife spoiled me as if i had been a blessing to her they both required only one thing from me and that was to be in a good humour and in that i never thwarted them thank heaven so they called me rigolette note seven and the name has stuck to me as to mirth they set me the example for i never saw them sorrowful if ever there was a word it was the wife who said to her husband Crétu, you silly fellow do be quiet you make me laugh too much then he said to her hold your foolish tongue ramonette i don't know why he called her ramonette do be still 
you really make my sides ache you are so funny and then i laughed to see them laugh and in this way i was brought up and in this way they formed my disposition and i hope i have profited by it note seven the french verb rigoler is to be merry e t most assuredly you have neighbour so there never were any disputes between them never oh never sunday monday and sometimes on tuesday they made holiday or kept wedding day as they called it and always took me with them papa Crétu was an excellent workman and when he chose to work he could earn what he pleased and so could his wife too if they had got enough to do for sunday and monday and live on pretty comfortably they were perfectly satisfied if after this they were on short allowance for a time they didn't mind it i remember when we had only bread and water papa Crétu took from his library he had a library then oh he used to call a little box so in which he put his collection of new songs for he bought all the new ones and knew them every one when then there was nothing but bread in the house he used to take an old cookery book from his library and say to us well now let us see what shall we eat to-day this or that and then he used to read out a long list of good things each of us chose a dish and then papa Crétu took an empty saucepan and with the funniest airs and gestures in the world pretended to put into the saucepan all the ingredients requisite for making a capital stew and then he used to pretend to pour it all out into a dish also empty which he placed on the table with still the same drollery which almost split our sides then he took up his book again and whilst he was reading to us for instance the recipe of a good fricassee of chicken which we had chosen and which made our mouths water we ate our bread all laughing like so many mad people and in this happy household were there any debts to trouble them none whatever so long as the money lasted they ate drank and made merry and when it was all gone they lived upon make-believe as before and did they never think of the future oh yes they thought of it of course but what is the future to such as we present and future are like sunday and monday the one we spent gaily and happily outside the barriers the other is got over in the faubourg and why since this couple seems so well assorted did they never marry a friend of theirs once put that very question in my presence well and what did they say oh said they if ever we have any children it may all very well to marry but as far as we are concerned we do very well as we are and why should we make an obligation of that which we now perform willingly besides getting married costs money and we have none to spare in unnecessary expenses but my goodness added rigolette how i am running on but really when once i begin to talk of these kind people who were so good to me i never know when to leave off here neighbour will you give me my shawl off the bed and put it nicely over my shoulders then pin it underneath the collar of my habit shirt with this large pin and then we will set off for it will take us some time to select the different things you wish to buy for the poor morels rodolph readily obeyed the directions of rigolette first he took from the bed a large plaid shawl which he placed with all imaginable care on the well-formed shoulders of rigolette that will do neighbour now lift up my collar and press the shawl and dress together then stick in the pin but pray try not to prick me with it the prince executed the orders given with zealous accuracy then observed smilingly to the grisette ah mademoiselle rigolette i should not like to be your femme de chambre there is danger in it yes i know answered rigolette gaily there is great danger for me of having a pin run in by your awkwardness but now added she after they had left the room and carefully locked the door after them take my key it is so large i always expect it will burst my pocket it is as large as a pistol and here the light-hearted girl laughed merrily at her own conceit rodolph accordingly took charge that is the prescribed form of speech of an enormous key which might well have figured in one of those allegorical devices in which the vanquished are represented as humbly offering the keys of their lost cities to the conquerors although rodolph believed himself too much changed by years to run any risk of being recognized by polidori he still deemed it prudent to draw up the collar of his paletot as he passed by the door of the apartments belonging to the quack bradamanti neighbour said rigolette 
don't forget to tell monsieur pipelet that you are about to send in some things which are to be carried at once up to your chamber you are right my good friend let us step into the porter's lodge for an instant monsieur pipelet with his everlasting bell-shaped hat on his head dressed as usual in the accustomed green coat and seated before a table covered with scraps of leather and fragments of boots and shoes was occupied in fixing a new sole on a boot his whole look and manner impressed with the same deeply meditative air which characterized his usual proceedings anastasie was just then absent from the lodge well monsieur pipelet said rigolette i hope you will be pleased to hear the good news thanks to my good neighbour here the poor morels have got out of trouble la when one thinks of that poor man being taken off to prison oh those bailiffs have no hearts nor manners either mademoiselle rejoined m pipelet in an angry tone wrathfully brandishing the boot then in progress of repair and into which he had inserted his left hand and arm no i have no hesitation in declaring in the face of all mankind that they are a set of mannerless scoundrels why taking advantage of the darkness of our stairs they actually carried their indecent violence so far as to lay their audacious fingers upon the waist of my wife when i first heard the cries of her insulted modesty i could not restrain myself and spite of all efforts to restrain myself i yielded to the natural impetuosity of my disposition yes i will frankly confess my first impulse was to remain perfectly motionless but i suppose afterwards said rigolette who had much ado to preserve a serious air afterwards m pipelet you pursued them and bestowed the punishment they so well deserved i'll tell you mademoiselle answered pipelet deliberately when these shameless ruffians passed before my lodge my blood boiled and i could not prevent myself from hastily covering my face that i might not be shocked by the sight of these luxurious malefactors but afterwards i ceased to be astonished for well i knew i might expect some sight or sound to shock my senses full well i was prepared for some direful misfortune ere the day had passed for i dreamed last night of cabrion rigolette smiled while the heavy groans which broke from the oppressed mind of the porter were mingled with blows of his hammer as he vigorously applied it to the sole of the boot he was mending you wisely chose the wisest part my dear m pipelet that of despising offences and holding it beneath you to revenge them but try to forget these ill-conducted bailiffs and oblige me by doing me a great favour man is born to help his fellow-man drawled out pipelet in a melancholy and sententious tone and he is still further called upon so to do when a good and worthy gentleman moreover a lodger in one's house is concerned what i have to request of you is to carry up to my apartments for me several things i am about to send in and which are for the morels make yourself easy upon that point monsieur replied pipelet i will faithfully perform your wishes and afterwards said rodolphe mournfully you must obtain a priest to watch by a little girl the morels have lost in the night go and give the requisite notification of the death and bespeak a suitable funeral make your mind easy monsieur replied pipelet more gravely even than before directly my wife returns i will go to the mayor the church and the traiteurs to the church for the soul of the dead to the traiteurs for the body of the living added m pipelet philosophically and poetically consider it done in both cases my good sir consider it done at the entrance to the alley rodolphe and rigolette encountered anastasie returning from market with a huge basket of provisions that's right that's right cried the porteress looking at the pair with a knowing and significant air there you go arm in arm already to be sure look and love love and look young people will be young people no doubt aunt me and alfred was just the same who ever heard of a pretty girl without a bow so go along my dears and make yourselves happy while you can then after gazing after them some minutes the old woman disappeared in the depths of the alley crying out alfred my old darling don't worry yourself stasie's coming to bring you something nice oh so nice end of chapter fourteen part two end of the mysteries of paris volume two by eugene sue read by celine major